My wife has repeatedly brought up the idea of divorce in response to the smallest issues that arise in our daily life. In one instance, after another disagreement, I simply replied with, okay, and left the situation behind. Currently, I am staying with my sister. My wife and I have shared five years together as a couple, having been married for four of those years, and we had known each other for several years before that. We have one child, a daughter who is four years old. I am the primary breadwinner in our household, as my wife has made the decision not to return to work for the past year and a half. Throughout this time, our arguments have occurred about one or two times per month. To clarify, I am very involved in our daughter's life. I help out with her care, I cook, I clean, and I do my best to contribute to the household. The first time my wife mentioned the possibility of divorce was during an argument that arose after my sister called to ask if she could stay with us for a while, as she was going through her own relationship issues. I agreed to let my sister come live with us temporarily, but my wife was upset about that decision. I reminded her that just a couple of months prior, a friend of hers stayed with us for five weeks without contributing much to the household. To me, this was not fair, especially since my sister has a wonderful relationship with our daughter and is a great help around the house. My sister stayed with us for a week and helped out, doing some cooking and cleaning, as well as looking after our daughter. I thought that after all this, we could forgive each other and move forward. However, most of our disagreements tend to revolve around small matters, and I can say that 90% of the time, I am not the one who initiates the arguments. I have suggested going to therapy or counseling, but my wife has consistently said that we don't need it. Just last night, she picked a fight with me, claiming that I was spending too much time at work and that she felt abandoned, saying I wasn't a good father. She ended her emotional outburst with the declaration that she wanted a divorce. In response, I stood up and explained that the reason I work so much is to support our family, particularly since she has chosen not to work. During our argument, I mistakenly referred to our finances as my money, while I was typing out the financial arrangement we had agreed on, which included splitting our income into bills, savings for our future, and fund money. She has repeatedly refused to consider getting a job or pursuing education to help contribute to our family's needs. I take pride in being there for my daughter, attending her important events, functions, and doctor's appointments, doing everything I can to support her. Despite my efforts to encourage my wife to seek help through therapy or counseling, she has always pushed back, insisting that there is no need. At this point, I feel like I can't continue in this situation anymore. I've decided to have my lawyer prepare the divorce papers to send to her. I took our daughter's belongings and left for my sister's house. It has now been two days, and my wife has been reaching out, apologizing for her words and expressing that she didn't mean what she said. She is saying that she wants to go to counseling and that she needs me, that she misses me, and so on. I find myself unsure of how to proceed. While I do have love for her and acknowledge that she is a good mother, I am deeply conflicted about whether I can continue with this relationship. I have retained a lawyer to help me navigate this situation, as well as to manage my work matters. To update everyone, this is unfortunately not a positive turn of events. A few months ago, I shared my frustrations about how my wife continuously brought up divorce. After I took the step of leaving with my daughter, it felt necessary to vent about my experiences. I want to clarify some things from earlier comments I received. If faced with the same situation again, I would have made the same choices, including leaving with my daughter. I've encouraged my wife to seek employment, pick up a hobby, and meet new friends, but she has been resistant to all of that. She often insists that she is not the problem in our relationship. My daughter is my main priority, and I make sure not to argue with my wife in front of her. I understand the implications of growing up in a tense home. I experienced it myself, where my father's anger directed at my mother ended up affecting me as a child. I never want my daughter to find herself in a similar position. The reality is that you cannot force someone to seek help if they are not ready for it. They have to genuinely want to change, or they will only go through the motions. I recognize that I am not without fault in this situation but the way things have unfolded leaves me feeling lost. I acknowledge my role in the situation, but I cannot allow my daughter to grow up thinking that the negative behaviors we are displaying are acceptable, nor can I let her believe that this is what relationships are meant to be like. I made a promise to myself at a young age that I would not emulate my father's ways. After sharing my feelings in a recent post, I found myself with a lot to think about. I realized the importance of having a serious conversation with my daughter. We sat down, and I made it clear that I could no longer tolerate the constant fighting and threats of divorce. It needed to end. 
She understood and assured me that she would refrain from using the word, divorce, going forward. I emphasized that if it ever came up again, it would be the last time we discussed it. Together, we agreed to attend couples therapy. The therapy sessions opened our eyes to many aspects of our relationship. We talked about our feelings, and the presence of a professional helped us gain a better understanding of one another. After a few sessions, I felt hopeful. My daughter began to show more initiative. She secured a job, made new friends, and even found a hobby that she enjoyed. However, things took a turn when an argument erupted over plans we had made regarding our daughter. She had overlooked our plans and made arrangements with her new co-workers that she could not cancel. At what I thought was the conclusion of the argument, I heard her mutter under her breath. I knew marrying you was a mistake. This statement stuck with me, and I looked at her, realizing that the woman before me seemed unrecognizable. I asked her to repeat herself, and she bluntly stated that she should have divorced me years ago. Feeling overwhelmed, I left with our daughter and carried on with our plans, just the two of us. Shortly after, I filed for legal separation. The terms we both agreed upon outlined that while we remained legally married, we would not date anyone during this separation. Our finances were to be separate, but the bills would continue to be split as they had been. I would continue to pay for health insurance through my job. The agreement also stated that both individual and couples therapy sessions would continue. As part of this arrangement, I would move in with my sister, and we decided on a shared custody plan for our daughter, with me having 70% of the time and her 30%. One day, I needed my wife to take care of our daughter for a short while. I informed her a week in advance, and she agreed. However, on the morning I was to drop our daughter off, I noticed an unfamiliar car parked in the driveway. My immediate thought was that she might have a friend visiting, so I rang the doorbell to be respectful, waiting with my daughter. To my surprise, a shirtless young man, around 20 years old, answered the door and asked who I was and what I wanted. I inquired about my wife, and he called for her. Soon after, she appeared in a robe, and her expression transformed from curiosity to shock, and then to horror and sadness. In just three months, when the legal separation period concludes, I will be filing for a decree of dissolution of marriage. My daughter is safe, although she is confused, only understanding that mommy and daddy are not happy. As I mentioned before, she remains my priority. Ironically, despite my efforts to avoid repeating the patterns of my parents, I now find myself in a similar situation. I struggle to comprehend what a healthy relationship looks like, yet I hope to demonstrate my love for my daughter and raise her in the best way I can. I appreciate the support, comments, love, and even the criticism I have received. Now, I will move on to another story. In this next narrative, I grapple with the question of whether I am wrong for insisting that my sister uphold her end of our custody agreement. To provide some context, my sister, Lily, who is 35 years old and has a 9-year-old daughter named Emma, had Emma when she was 26. At that time, she was living with our parents alongside her boyfriend, and both were recently out of rehab for heroin addiction. Unfortunately, both Lily and her boyfriend struggled to maintain their sobriety and continued to use drugs throughout Lily's pregnancy. When Emma was nearly two months old, Lily came to me in desperation, asking for help. She wanted me to take care of Emma for two months while she checked into rehab again to get clean. At that point, I was just 22 years old, living in a small efficiency apartment and attending law school. My parents believed they could not take care of an infant and even suggested placing Emma in foster care. After going through a difficult period, I recommended that my sister consider putting her child into foster care. When my sister finally completed her rehabilitation program, I decided to take care of her daughter, Emma, and my other niece, Dot. Unfortunately, my sister soon reunited with her boyfriend, who was still struggling with substance abuse issues. This led to a challenging situation that lasted for five long years, during which one of them would get clean, only for the other to pull them back into addiction. Recognizing the instability in their lives, I took legal guardianship of Emma, although I had intended it to be a temporary arrangement. Each time my sister expressed a desire to take Emma back, I would agree, but only on the condition that both she and her boyfriend passed a drug test. Sadly, that condition was never met. When Emma was nearly six years old, my sister approached me with the news that she was pregnant again. This was a significant turning point for her, as she managed to stay clean for almost eight months leading up to the birth of my nephew. Transitioning Emma from living with me to moving back in with her parents was not easy for either of us. We went to court to establish a custody arrangement that allowed me to have Emma every weekend while she spent the week with her mother and father. 
For the first year, we all participated in family therapy together, which helped us settle into a routine before we eventually stopped attending sessions. However, complications arose once more when my sister announced she was pregnant again. Both she and her now husband indicated that they didn't want Emma to come spend weekends with me anymore. They claimed that Emma was coming home from my place acting like a brat. I could see their perspective and tried to explain that when Emma is with me, she is the center of attention. Going from such focused care to competing for her mother's limited attention amidst morning sickness must be challenging for her. In an effort to be supportive, I offered to take care of my new nephew on weekends as well, which would provide my sister with a much-needed break. I even suggested that we restart family therapy to help Emma navigate these changes. Unfortunately, my sister simply responded by stating that Emma would take a break from visiting me. After allowing two weekends to pass without seeing Emma, I grew concerned and threatened legal action, as we have a custody agreement in place and I remain one of her legal guardians. My sister accused me of bringing up past issues and interfering with her ability to be a good mother. This put me in a difficult position. I had raised Emma for nearly six years and cherish every moment I spend with her. However, I wonder if my presence is creating tension in their family. Emma calls me every evening, asking about our weekend plans and expressing that she misses me. I can't shake the feeling that my sister is portraying the situation as me not wanting Emma to be with her, when all I truly want is the best for her. To clarify, Emma is now nine years old, and my sister has been clean for over three years. We have gradually transitioned Emma from living with me to a more balanced arrangement. She spent weekends with her parents every other weekend for a year, then moved to a 50-50 split, and now I have her on weekends. For those who believe I am hindering family time, I have always been accommodating. If they notify me of weekend plans, I willingly allow them to take Emma. This situation is not about my sister wanting quality time with Emma. It feels more like they are trying to keep me from spending time with her. They have sent Emma's brother to my parents' house on weekends, which allows them some time alone. Recently, they have also sent Emma to her grandparents' house, so there is no difference whether I take her or not. My sister is a stay-at-home mom, which gives her plenty of time with Emma. She rarely leaves the house and has struggled with her weight, often resulting in a chaotic living environment. My parents even bought my sister a house when Emma was three, hoping it would help her regain custody. I work in IT and manage to support Emma's activities, including karate, swimming, and Girl Scouts, making sure to stay in constant contact with her to ensure she is thriving. While my sister's boyfriend has relapsed twice in the past three years, he was removed from the house each time, ensuring that Emma did not have to witness any of the distressing events. For those who think I am using Emma as a form of babysitting, I assure you that is not the case. My sister tends to remain home most of the time, while I prioritize Emma's engagement in various activities, believing that it is essential for her growth and happiness. It is crucial for her well-being that she spends time outside the house and engages in various activities. Recently, she was entrusted with the responsibility of watching her three-year-old brother for a duration of two hours, and she was absolutely thrilled about it, especially when she received a payment of $20 for her efforts. However, I must admit that the comments speculating about the situation at home with Emma have caused me considerable concern. In response to these worries, I decided to reach out to the therapist who previously worked with Emma and scheduled an appointment for this coming Friday after school, following our usual routine. During our therapy sessions, the structure involves Emma speaking with her therapist alone at first, allowing her to express her thoughts and feelings freely. After that, I join in for a discussion where we can talk openly about everything together. It is essential for me to convey to Emma that she is deeply valued and that I will always have time for her reinforcing the idea that she will always be wanted in my life. I also intend to inquire about her happiness living with her parents and whether she wishes for us to spend less time there. Your support and well wishes are greatly appreciated as I navigate this delicate situation. The comments regarding the transition have highlighted the importance of being patient during this process. I am committed to preserving the bond between us, and it has been a gradual journey. For almost a year, they had Emma every other weekend before we decided to change her primary residence. I am fully aware of the legal pathways available to me as a lawyer. I understand the intricacies of the law thoroughly, including potential loopholes, and I have established relationships within the legal system. Therefore, I am confident that if I believed Emma was in an unsafe environment, regaining custody would be a feasible option. However, I grapple with the ethical considerations of such a decision. Emma has made it clear that she sees me as a mother which adds complexity to the situation. 
My sister carries a heavy burden of guilt for not being present in Emma's early life and is striving to be the best mother she can be. It's challenging to maintain clarity in such a complicated scenario. Our transition was deliberate. Initially, they had weekends with Emma for the first year, followed by a 50-50 custody arrangement for nearly a year. Currently, I have her on weekends for almost a year now. Emma's behavior was positive until my sister became pregnant again. She genuinely cherished the prospect of having a little brother, and even started referring to my sister as mom for the first time. I have been funding Emma's education, ensuring she attends the same private school where she thrived during preschool and kindergarten. She was progressing well, benefiting from a stable social environment and supportive teachers. However, I noticed a shift in her behavior when she returned from weekends with me. She would be uncooperative with her parents for the first couple of days each week. By the time my sister felt Emma had adapted to their house rules, it would be time for my weekend with her again, and this pattern perpetuated itself. My sister has been open about her feelings of jealousy toward me, not only about my relationship with Emma, but also regarding my ability to provide her with resources that she struggles to offer. It's true that I indulge Emma, as I want to give her everything possible. Despite my sister's concerns that I spoil Emma, I see it as a natural instinct to want to provide for her. In their home, Emma seems to resist following directives, such as cleaning up after herself or limiting her screen time. Our dynamics differ greatly. When Emma is with me, we engage in numerous activities throughout the weekend, and I have a dishwasher to simplify chores, which means she only has to put her dishes away. I've never encountered issues with her listening to me. There's a lot of guilt tied to Emma calling me. Mom. For the first three years of her life, she referred to me in that way. However, when my sister visited one day and heard Emma calling me, Mom, it led to an emotional breakdown, during which she questioned how I could allow Emma to think of me as her mother. This moment caused confusion and fear for Emma, and with our parents involved, we ultimately decided that she should call me something other than, Mom, while there is no definitive agreement on what she should call me, most opinions lean toward me not being the mother. In my latest update, I've received numerous requests for news about the situation. The past month has been chaotic, and a significant change occurred as my sister has given birth, and I now have custody of all three of her children. I arranged an emergency therapy session for Emma, during which she disclosed some unsettling revelations about the mental manipulation she experienced from Lily. For instance, my sister had allegedly told Emma that she had to plead with me to take her as a baby, implying that I had never wanted her and had returned her as soon as I was able. While I recognize that my sister is trying her best, it's clear that these dynamics have impacted Emma negatively. Initially, I was hesitant about taking my niece in. At that time, I was navigating my first year in law school, living in a small efficiency apartment, and struggling financially. The thought of caring for an infant, even for just a couple of months while I was still in school, felt overwhelming and daunting. I couldn't quite see how I would manage this responsibility alongside my studies. I relied heavily on government assistance and support from my parents. However, this reliance did not diminish my love for my niece, nor did it mean I wanted to give her up. I was genuinely trying to make the best decisions for her welfare at every opportunity. After a therapy session, I took the significant step of filing for an emergency custody order. My reasoning for this decision included concerns about parental alienation, as well as what I considered a critical factor, my sister's use of marijuana which violated the conditions under which she was allowed to have custody. Marijuana is illegal in my state, and my sister did not possess a prescription. In my custody request, I also asked for a drug test and a home visit. Additionally, I noted the condition of her home, explaining that while it was messy, it had deteriorated to a level that posed health risks and resembled a hoarding situation. The court granted my request for emergency custody, and shortly after, Child Protective Services, CPS arrived at my sister's home the following Monday. While I anticipated the intervention of CPS, I felt a sense of confidence that I could successfully gain custody of my niece. This confidence stemmed from my knowledge of my sister's marijuana use. To clarify, I didn't view her medical use of marijuana for migraines as an inherent problem. However, I also recognized that I could use this knowledge to my advantage if necessary. Unfortunately, what transpired next took an unexpected turn. Some individuals commented on my previous post, suggesting that I must harbor negative feelings toward my sister. This is not the case. I love her deeply and believe that many of her issues arise from her trusting nature and the company she keeps. Nonetheless, I must express my frustration regarding my brother-in-law. 
When CPS arrived, they discovered that my brother-in-law was not only cultivating marijuana in the basement, but also growing psychedelic mushrooms. The drug test results indicated that both he and my sister had not only marijuana in their systems, but also several other substances, including fentanyl, likely mixed with whatever they were using. This led to their immediate removal from the home, and CPS reached out to me to take custody of my nephew. Both my brother-in-law and sister were arrested on drug-related charges specific to his horticultural activities. In all honesty, I did not foresee this turn of events. I was aware that my sister was struggling with depression, but I had not recognized the severity of her substance use, especially given her pregnancy. The feelings of betrayal I experienced were profound. After quickly adjusting to life with two children, I knew my sister would soon have another infant, so I made the decision to visit her in jail. During this visit, I proposed a deal, she would relinquish all parental rights to her three children in exchange for my assistance in paying her bail and securing her a lawyer to help her avoid jail time. Sadly, I also had to cover my brother-in-law's bail and legal fees. My sister gave birth just a week ago, thankfully avoiding the need to deliver in jail, and I am relieved to report that my new nephew appears to be healthy despite her drug and alcohol issues during pregnancy. I now have full custody of my niece, Emma, and both her brothers. I am in the process of filing for legal adoption, which differs significantly from guardianship. I am confident that I will succeed in this endeavor, given that both parents have signed over their rights. The past has illuminated my desire to avoid being in a state of uncertainty, hoping for my sister to become clean long enough to regain custody. I have also learned that I cannot trust her, and I do not wish to co-parent with someone who resorts to dishonesty and manipulation as she has done. On a positive note, Emma is thriving in my care. I have never seen her so happy. Despite some sleepless nights with the baby, we are managing well. My greatest concern remains my three-year-old nephew Ian. While he has adapted so far, I don't believe he fully understands that this situation is permanent. We will certainly pursue family therapy to help all of us navigate this transition. I hope I have covered all the essential details. I want to express my gratitude to everyone who supported me in recognizing that things were not right with Emma. Without your input, I can't bear to think about what might have happened. Additionally, I have noticed considerable concern in the comments regarding my sister's situation. There has been a lot of concern expressed in the comments regarding my sister possibly having another baby. To clarify, it is highly unlikely that she will have more children. The main reason she became pregnant with Emma is that she was not using any form of birth control at that time. She believed she could not get pregnant because, as a teenager, she had one of her ovaries removed. Her doctor informed her that there was very little chance she would conceive again. When Emma was born, she was in a breech position, which led to my sister having to undergo a cesarean section. As a result of that surgery, she had cesareans with her other two children as well. Recently, when my latest nephew was born, there were some complications noted. The extensive scarring from her previous surgeries, combined with her having only one ovary, led the doctor to conclude that it is very unlikely she will become pregnant again. While it's not completely impossible for her to have another child, the odds are so low that I have decided not to worry about that for now, especially with everything else on my plate that requires my attention. Regarding other comments about my life, I have been out of law school for almost seven years. After graduating, I worked as an ADA, assistant district attorney, for a while, and now my focus is on being a criminal defense attorney. Occasionally, I also handle some family law cases. At the moment, I am pursuing a business certification in international law. Having been raised in Europe and now living in the United States, I have an interest in possibly transitioning to work for an international company that may involve travel opportunities. However, any job changes I consider will have to take my children into account. As for my family dynamics, my parents and I are currently taking a break from each other. This situation began when I filed for emergency custody, which understandably made my parents very upset. During that time, we exchanged some harsh words. I recognized their perspective, as it appeared that my sister's family had managed to get their lives together, and they may have felt I was trying to disrupt that stability. However, I believe things have changed since then. This is the first time my parents have chosen not to help my sister out, and they haven't reached out to me either. I think it's best if I give it some time. Right now, I am feeling sleep-deprived and overwhelmed, so I want to hold off on saying anything further that I might later regret.